Good morning, everybody. Hope you're well. Happy Autumn Statement Day. Anybody's looking forward to uh, Mr. Hunt standing up later on and uh, telling us what he's going to do with our hard earned. Um, and welcome to today's webinar, How to Boost Growth Cut Costs by Improving Your Conversion Rates. Last yardstick webinar of the year. Uh, we're giving you all a break in December. We'll be back in January. Um, but in time on a tradition, Dan, do you want to just tell people how we're going to do things? Your thing. Last webinar of the year. What are we going to do next month, Phil? It's not fair, is it? Um, so I'm Dan. I'm the head of branding and design here at the Eidstick Agency. And for the webinar regulars among you, you'll know that I was out sick last month, which naturally led to some serious FOMO. Um, so a big thanks to Abby, who filled my usual role as Phil's glamorous assistant last month. Um, and if this is the first Yardstick webinar you've ever attended, um, the glamorous assistant role means I may well be sawn in half by Phil at some point. So you've got plenty to look forward to. Um, other than that, I'll be keeping us on track and on time. And most importantly of all, I'll be reading out your questions and comments as we go. Um, now, we're going to be talking about how to improve conversion rates today, which is a topic that begged much discussion. So ask away, ask your questions, share your experiences. Um, of what has and what hasn't worked. Uh, tell us if we're speaking sense. Tell us if we're speaking the opposite. Tell us, tell us everything. Um, and as usual, there are two ways that you can do that. So use the chat function um, or the Q&A box. I'll be monitoring both. Um, Abby tends to answer some of the simpler questions um, and any spicy ones I tend to read out for everyone so we can, we can all benefit from the answer. Um, so I'll sweep them up at natural breaks and we'll have a period at the end where we can um, have any final ones, time permitting. Um, and here's a little treat for us all. I'll answer a question that hasn't been asked yet. Um, yes, we are going to be recording the session. Uh, a follow-up email with that video and any notes or resources we mentioned will be sent out later today, courtesy of Abby. Um, so without further ado, Phil, how can we boost growth, cut costs and improve our conversion rates? Yes, Dan. Um, so I've just launched a poll as well, um, and if actually 58% of people have answered the question on the poll, if you're the, oh no, 63, it's going up, it's going up, and if everyone could just answer the question on the poll, that would be great. Uh, really appreciate the insights there, and we're going to, we'll have a look at that and reveal those results in a bit. Um, but we should explain, first of all, what we're going to talk about today. So we're going to start by talking about the benefits of improving your conversion rate. Um, why bother? Why bother trying to focus on conversion rate? Um, we're then going to talk about the raw data that you need to be recording to be able to calculate your conversion rates. Five conversion rates you should be monitoring. It isn't just total leads to new clients. There are five, at least five conversion rates you should be monitoring. Some thoughts around benchmarks and what you should be aiming for in the business. Look at the reasons why prospects aren't converting, and then some ways to improve your conversion rate. So that's what we're gonna be talking about today. Pretty packed hour. Um, but as Dan said, do ask questions, do give us feedback and do share your experiences. Um, we hope these webinars add value. Um, and one of the reasons they add value is because of the input that we get from everybody on these sessions. So do put your comments in the chat, your questions in the Q and A and do vote in the poll. So the first thing we should do is define what I mean by conversion rate. And what I mean by conversion rate is pretty straightforward. It's the proportion of prospects. So for prospects, we new inquiries who take a desired action. And that action might be becoming a client, agreeing to initial meeting, move that meeting to a presentation meeting, uh, because there's more than one conversion rate. But the definition of conversion rate for me is the proportion of prospects who take a desired action. So hopefully we've got that out of the way now. And what are the benefits of improving conversion rates? So I've thought about this a lot during the year. There was a really good podcast, um, Stephen Bartlett, Diary of a CEO uh, podcast that Rory Sutherland appeared on earlier on in the year. And he was talking a lot about conversion rates. And one of the points he made is essentially what's the point of putting new prospects into a funnel which isn't going to uh, isn't going to convert them he's got a point there's not a lot of reason for doing that and too many people 
think marketing is only about creating new leads. And it is partly about creating new leads, but it isn't only about creating new leads. It's about creating leads that can convert and helping them to convert as well. So if we look at the benefits of improving your conversion rate, every prospect that comes into your business, every new inquiry that comes into your business can be given essentially one of three tags. First tag is that they engage immediately. You're right for them, they're right for you, it's a marriage made in heaven, um, and there's never any doubt that they are going to become a client. So that's the first tag. The second tag is the complete opposite of that. You're not right for them, they're not right for you, and assuming nothing changes significantly, the two things are never going to, uh, the two meetings of mind will never happen. And they probably are not going to engage. It's the middle group that are most important. And the middle group are the group of people who you know you can help. You know financial planning will benefit them. But for whatever reason, they don't engage immediately. And every business, even your friendly marketing agency, has prospects like this. Might be one or two of you on this call. But you've got two choices with prospects like that. First choice is you ignore them. You don't go back to them. You do nothing to nurture them. Second choice is the opposite. You nurture them. You add value to them, you demonstrate your expertise. By doing those things, you're positioning yourself as the expert and you're positioning yourself as the go back to expert, the go back to expert. So it's you that they come back to when the time is right for them to engage, not somebody else. And it's pretty obvious which is the right choice there. Yeah, The first choice, doing nothing, means you will have wasted the time and money you invested in creating that inquiry. The second choice means you will improve your conversion rate. And maximizing your conversion rate, doing everything you can to maximize your conversion rate, nurturing these people, as I say, means you will do two things. You will spend less money on marketing. It's not a great business plan for us because you'll spend less money with yardstick but you will spend less money on marketing because you don't need to create so many inquiries. Firms with high conversion rates need to create fewer inquiries than firms with low conversion rates. And secondly, you will be operationally more efficient. And there's huge benefits for being operationally more efficient. It improves profit margins, it improves morale, it improves service that you give to your clients etc and you'll be operationally more efficient because you need to do see fewer do fewer fact finds see fewer prospects to get to the same point to take on the same number of clients so for me the two benefits of focusing on conversion rate at least as much if not more than the number of new inquiries you're getting as i say you'll spend less money on marketing you'll be operationally more efficient that improves your bottom line in your business etc etc so there's huge wins for focusing on your conversion rate. But the first thing we need to understand is what your conversion rate is. And to understand what your conversion rate is, there are certain data points that we need to record. So that's what we're going to talk about now. And we believe there are 12 data points that you should record for every single new inquiry. I just want to pause there a second. Because often when we talk about recording these data points for every single new inquiry, advisors sometimes overcomplicate it by saying, do we need to record this, this, or this? Simple answer is yes. Every person that makes an inquiry into your business, no matter whether it's the perfect inquiry or the worst inquiry in the world, absolutely you need to record. Because if you don't, you're creating a false, po falsely positive picture about your marketing, because it tends to be the poor inquiries 
that don't get recorded. And therefore you can't draw conc evidence-based conclusions or accurate evidence-based conclusions about the, the quality of your marketing. And the second thing, if you don't have people's names and email addresses, you can't nurture them. For example, we believe it's best practice, as we'll talk about in a bit, for every new inquiry to immediately be put into your newsletter database and then for you to send them a newsletter every month. If you don't record the inquiry, don't have their name and email address, how can you possibly add them into your newsletter database? As an aside, you also need to get GDPR right. But from a basic perspective, if you're not recording their data, you don't have their name and email address, it makes nurturing impossible. So back to these 12 data points that we believe you should record for every new inquiry. The first five are pretty straightforward. Uh, what I'd say about the first one is just remember that someone's name and their known by name might be slightly different. Um, and there are three examples on this call. Abby, Dan and Phil. I suspect we were all christened with slightly longer names. Yeah. So the, our known by name is slightly different to our, our full name. And the reason you need their known by name is simply so that you can personalize emails. So first five data points, first name and known by name, last name, email address, telephone number, the date the inquiry was received. Not particularly controversial. Number six. Very few firms, when we start working with them, actually record this data. But it's really important, as we'll see in a bit when we look at the ratios you should be looking at. And it's a very simple gut feel. Do you want to work with this prospect? Now, you might know on that first email to you or that first inquiry whether you want to work with the prospect or not. You might know after the first phone call. You'll certainly know after the first meeting. And that is a gut feel. Is this person, by whatever metrics you want to measure, the right fit for your business? Do you want to be working with that person? And we'll look at why we need that data point in a minute. The next six. Was the first meeting agreed? Yes, no, to be confirmed. Did the prospect become a client? Yes, no, to be confirmed. The reason the prospect didn't become a client. Now, this is really important. And again, a lot of firms don't uh, record this information. And we want to know why people didn't become a client. Because if we've got that information, we can do something with it. And as we'll see in a bit, most firms don't convert most prospects. Yeah? Conversion rates is generally sub 50%. Headline conversion rates are generally sub 50%. So it makes sense that we want to know why prospects aren't converting, because we might there might be some patterns there, and there might be something we can do about it. The source of the inquiry, um, and this is really important that we get this right. So the source of the inquiry is not email, telephone, walk-in, inquiry form. They are methods of communication. The source, and it sometimes takes a little bit of digging with prospects to find it out, but the source is the first time they became aware of you. So if somebody is referred to you by John Smith and sends an email to the office, the source is not email, the source is John Smith. If someone sees a LinkedIn post and then sends you a DM on LinkedIn, uh, the source isn't LinkedIn DMs, it's, it's LinkedIn. So the source is the point where they first became aware of you. The last two, if it was a referral from an existing client or professional connection, the name of the existing client or professional connection, so you can show thank you um, and show how much you appreciate being passed on. And then lastly, the revenue generated. And that might be initial fee, ongoing fee, AUM, is some metrics so we can start to measure return on investment. So those are 12 data points that we should be, should be recording. Um, we'll talk in a minute about where we record it, but Dan, I think there's a question. Yeah, there certainly is. So 
Uh, well, two questions, actually. The first from David, um, and it's just some, I guess, firming up of the definition of a lead. So David asks, would you consider someone as a lead um, and record and include into your conversion data um, ones that just download a form from your website, et cetera, or other digital leads as such? So, David, do you mean there's someone completing um, a form so that they download a guide or an asset from the website? If they do, then, yeah, I would be putting them in there. They are nowhere near as strong a lead as a referral from a client or professional connection. But assuming you're following that lead up um, with a trigger campaign, a nurturing campaign, a telephone call, invites to other events and assets, then, yeah, I would be putting that in there. Perfect. Thanks. Um, and Gordon asks a great question. Um, what about location in terms of raw data that we need to record? Um, absolutely. If it's relevant for your business, then record it. I'm trying to think of the relevancy. Um, but yes, if you feel it's relevant and is an important data point, then why not record it? These 12 are the minimum that I would be recording. There may be other specific data points that firms want to record for themselves. Brilliant, thanks. Um, let's carry on. Yeah, make that sip of tea a quick one. Yeah, no problem. So there's the 12 data points. The obvious next conversation is where you record this data. And for me, you've got three options. Um, first is a spreadsheet um, or a shared Google Sheet or something like that. And we've prepared a inquiry recording spreadsheet template uh, that we've given away dozens of times in the past. Um, and Abby, if you can put that in the follow-up, that would be good. Cheers. Um, and that spreadsheet works where inquiry levels are relatively low, um, sophistication levels of the business are relatively low, the other two versions, the other two options don't work, or where there's only one or two advisors in the business. Um, spreadsheets, fine for that sort of thing. You could use a traditional back office system, uh, whatever back office system you use, they all have some lead functionality. They generally don't have nurturing functionality that you might get in a sales-based CRM. Uh, and they generally, as the same is true of the spreadsheet, don't do the conversion rate calculations that we're going to come on to in a second. So you would need to manually calculate those either on a monthly, quarterly, six monthly or annual basis. Um, but the traditional advisor back office, that's an option. And then we've got some firms generally larger firms, generally those who are more invested in conversion rates and nurturing of leads, and generally those with bigger leads, bigger lead numbers, may well use a sales-based CRM. So we've got clients using HubSpot, Pipedrive, Salesforce. Um, they've all got different price points, different features, different benefits. But those are essentially the three places that you could record those 12 data points. Key point on them all, you need to keep it up to date. So you need to put the, get the data on there in the first place, but then it needs to be kept up to date as the prospect goes through your sales funnel. Um, but then it's safe. Those are the three places that you can record this information. Question, Dan? Yeah, fantastic question in from Quinn, who asks, uh, how would you typically inform a prospect that you may not be suited to one another without offending them? Um, it's very much a, it's not you, it's me, but in some cases, it is them, isn't it? It's a really good question, Quinn. Um, and I think for me, I'd say two things. The first is just be honest and genuine reasons why. Um, honesty goes a long way these days. And I think you just need to be honest and explain why you don't think this is a good fit. It might be that you don't supply the service that they want. They might want equity release. You might have equity release permissions. Really simple. It might be that your minimum fee will mean that actually they don't get value from working with you. Um, I think those sort of conversations are probably quite easy. I think there's harder conversations when there is the personality fit isn't right 
Um, and then you've got to find a form of words which gets that gets that across, um, which is, I accept, harder. The second thing I think I would always do, Quinn, I wouldn't, actually, I don't think I would always do it, I would always do it, is signpost people to somewhere else. So you have still been of benefit to them. You've still been of use to them. And let's say it was somebody coming in wanting a service that you don't offer, mortgages, equity release, wills, that sort of stuff. Then I would just have a list of people that you refer and you recommend on to it a trusted list of suppliers. Um, then if it is someone who needs, um, again, something you don't do, there's a better place for them, then money helper, and dare I say, uh, unbiased and vouched for, um, where they might be able to get the help and support that they need. So just don't be a dead end, Quinn. Always try and signpost them somewhere else. And there's a follow-up question from Quinn as well. Yeah, Phil. Um, so further to that then, how should you do that? Should it be over the phone, face to face? Will an email suffice? How do we break up with people? Um, it's a good question. I think you, when and how you do it is probably dictated by your sales process and that first interaction you have with them. So it might be the case that you book that first meeting by email and they turn up to a meeting, in which case it's face to face, isn't it? Um, it might be that someone moves into the office, you take that phone call and therefore, at that phone call, you're either booking them in for a meeting or saying, this isn't right, you're better off going here. Uh, so I think it's dependent on where you have that first interaction with the client and the most appropriate time to be having that conversation with them. And I would have it, difficult conversations aren't easy. Um, if you go and Google on YouTube, um, Simon Sinek, difficult conversations. There's some good stuff there about how to have difficult conversations. Um, but I would do it at the earliest opportunity, Quinn. Brilliant. Thanks, Phil. We do have another question from Charlie, but I am going to put that towards the end. That's a fairly open question around nurturing prospects, which I suspect could be another webinar entirely. So we will get to that, Charlie, but let's carry on with recording the data at the moment. Yeah, we've got a slide for that in a bit, Charlie. Yeah. Um, so we've talked about the data that you should be recording. We've talked about where to record the data. Now we need to talk about analyzing it and the five conversion rates that we believe all firms should be monitoring. And on these slides, they're all the same format. So a little explanation about the conversion rate and then the calculation. So headline conversion rate. Um, and this is probably the conversion rate that people first think of uh, when I talk about conversion rates. Um, and this is simply the total number of clients taken on divided by the total number of inquiries over a given period of time. So if you've had 100 inquiries year to date in 2023, um, and you have taken on 20 clients, then your conversion rate is 20%. Be matty than I can do. And we've also got to remember that there's a lag. So you're um, dividing the total number of inquiries by the total number of clients over that period of time. It may be that some of those clients, uh, the lead actually came in in the previous year. But the headline conversion rates, total number of clients taken on, divided by the total number of inquiries. And, and that's often where people stop. And if we look at the poll results, what have we got here? 64% of people, so nearly two thirds, monitor the rate they convert inquiries into new clients. 36% don't, so about a third don't. And I would suspect, I left it open to interpretation, but I would suspect the majority of people who answered that question did so um, believing that I was asking about this conversion rate. It's the most obvious, it's incredibly important, but it doesn't dig down into where your sales funnel is working and where your sales funnel is not working. So the next conversion rate to monitor is right fit rate. And this is simply the proportion of inquiries from right fit clients as a proportion of all new inquiries. 
So back to example, 100 uh, leads in year to date and 63 were right fit. Then you can start calculating your inquiry to right fit conversion rate. And we can then, as we'll see in a minute, convert right fit conversion rate to first meeting, to onboarded client, et cetera. And this is important because as we'll see in a bit, one of the reasons leads don't convert is that they're not right fit. Yeah? For whatever reason, you can't work with them. Going back to Quinn's question earlier. And if you've got a high percentage of inquiries that are not right fit, it indicates there is a problem with your marketing. You are, your marketing is generating inquiries from the wrong type of people. So monitoring your right fit rate is incredibly important, but you can't do that unless you are um, recording data point six, do you want to work with the prospect? Number three, your first meeting conversion rate. Um, and this is the proportion, there's two ways of doing this. This is the proportion of all inquiries who move to a first meeting. Or other way of doing it, the proportion of right fit inquiries that agree to a first meeting. And this is starting to show you how well your processes are working. I can remember one firm um, that we work with where decent lead levels, 20, 25 a month, 80% right fit, good number. So far, so good. The overall conversion rate, though, was down at 3 4%. It was absolutely tiny. And because they were monitoring this information, we could actually see that the largest drop-off, the most significant drop-off, was from inquiry coming in to booking first meeting. And we realized the problem was the advisors, multi-advisor firm, uh, eight advisors, they weren't ringing leads quickly. They were waiting five, seven, eight days before ringing a lead. And at worst, the, car, the prospect had gone cold and maybe was a bit annoyed. Um, but they also might have gone off somewhere, somewhere else. So that conversion rate, your first meeting conversion rate, either as a proportion of all inquiries or as a proportion of right fit inquiries, helps you to start understanding whether your processes, whether your sales funnel, and you're operationally, you're effective or not. Next. Next, next. First meeting to converting as a client. Dead straightforward. Uh, the total number of new clients divided by the total number of new meetings over the same period of time. And this starts to help you understand, have you got your proposition right? Have you got your pricing right? And, and it's not a dirty word, can the people who are presenting to prospects actually sell your proposition? Everybody is selling something. Financial advice, financial planning, mortgage advice, uh, social media, design, branding, whatever it is. Everybody is selling something. So the proportion of uh, new clients as a proportion of first meetings helps us understand, is your pricing right? Is your proposition right? Can the people who are presenting sell can they tell the story so that people prospects go ahead and then lastly a bit of a left field one but lastly your recommendation rate so if you've ever done any of our recommendation workshops you'll know we talk about recommendation rate a lot and your recommendation rate allows us to understand or help understand whether you are maximizing the potential for recommendations from your existing client bank. As we've said many times before, recommendations from existing clients are the best type of new inquiry. Got the highest conversion rate, lowest cost of acquisition. And therefore, we need to be strategic, we need to be intentional about maximizing the opportunity from your existing client bank. But it's not hard, to, not easy to compare firm with firm and other advisors uh, within a firm because they all have different numbers of clients. So your recommendation rate is simply calculated as the number of recommendations you receive in a year from an existing client divided by 
the total number of clients that you have. And that means you can compare firm A with firm B, so you can get a bit of a, an idea about how well you're doing, and you can compare other advisors in the firm as well. So five conversion rates there that we should all be monitoring. Headline conversion rate, right fit conversion rate, first meeting conversion rate in one of two ways. Uh, the sign-up rate from first meeting to sign-up, and then your recommendation rate. Five uh, conversion rates that you should know in your business. If you use pipe drive, Salesforce, HubSpot, should calculate most of those for you, certainly pipe drive does. If you use a spreadsheet for monitoring new inquiries or a back office system, you'll need to do it manually at different points in time. So Dan, before we go on to conversion benchmarks we should be aiming at, I can see a couple of things in the chat. Do we need to do anything with them? We certainly do. So Charlie asks a question around that fifth um, conversion rate, recommendation rate. Charlie asks, would a testimonial count or is it purely just referrals? No, so for me, I mean, you could, that, that could be a sixth or seventh one, Charlie. The proportion of your clients who have left a Google or Vouch for you. Um, so thanks for the inspiration there. We could make this presentation a little bit longer. But no, let's be really clear. A recommendation or referral is when somebody has passed your name on to somebody else and that person has then got in touch with your business. This number five, this, this, this fifth conversion rate is nothing to do with testimonials or client reviews. Brilliant. And then the second question is from David around those referrals. David asks, would you potentially have a different marketing strategy for prospects coming from existing client referrals? Yes. Um, if you imagine a, a, a holistic, all-encompassing marketing strategy for your business, then yes, there is a sub-strategy there based on educating clients, appreciating clients, nurturing clients to increase the number of referrals and recommendations that you receive. Uh, but yes, absolutely, there's research from Bouchfall that shows that 85% of clients have never been asked for a, a referral, um, which shows to me that advisors, planners are generally very passive when it comes to referrals and recommendations. And what they actually need to do is be more intentional, uh, be more strategic. Doesn't mean we need to go back 30 years and start using some of the techniques that was taught in direct sales decades ago. But it does need to mean we need to be more intentional, more strategic about it. Brilliant. And then the final question at the moment in from Matt, who asks, so the best practice is to then take this and do it per lead source. Um, that would be the next level down. It's a good point. Um, and so you, what we've talked about so far is these conversion rates. It's probably for the first four, to be fair, not this one, not number five. Um, but the good practice would be to take these first four conversion rates, calculate them for a business, the business's conversion rates, those four things. Um, and then you could subdivide it in probably two ways. The first is by source. Um, so you would expect to see the conversion rates on referrals being better than other sources of leads. But it's a good point. You could do it by source. The other thing you could do it by, Matt, in multi-advisor businesses is compare it by advisor. And that would help you understand maybe where some advisors need a bit of help, a bit of extra training, et cetera. But it's a good point. If you're going to do it, drill down past firm level for the first four, drill down based on source and advisors. Brilliant. And then... David's question around um, different marketing strategies for prospects coming from existing client referrals, um, they then caveat that with, they're also talking about whether to have a different funnel for those that come from referrals. Um, I'd be interested to know the logic for having a different, a different funnel um, and what you would change about it. Uh, I'd have to give that a bit of thought, but I'd be interested to know the, know the logic. Um, you certainly would have, so I'm thinking on the hoof, you certainly would have a different uh, funnel for, say, I don't know, someone who downloaded a guide from your website. That would have a very different funnel 
than somebody who was referred to by an existing partner or professional connection. There's a bunch of people in the middle out there who leave and vouch for unbiased from your website. It's probably going to, the sales model there is probably going to look fairly similar than for a referral from a client or professional connection. Good to carry on? Yes, absolutely. Right. So if we talked about the data you need to record, we talked about the five conversion rates. Um, and Matt's good point about um, running those conversion rates to different sources and different advisors. Then let's look at where I'd put pitch some benchmarks. Now, this next slide is broadly subjective. Um, some people will agree, some people will disagree. Really happy to have the debate. So this is kind of my opinion. So for me, the headline conversion rate and what I would call the blended headline conversion rate, and this is where you're putting all leads from all sources into the box and understanding how many converted. I would say the minimum benchmark you should be aiming at there is 25%, one in four. And um, I've seen at that blended level, the highest conversion rate I've seen at a blended level where I actually believe the data, it's about 48%, 49%, something like that. And I've seen it way down, two, 3%. Yeah, really, really low. Uh, but for that blended, where everything is going in the same box, it's probably about 25%. I would expect the minimum you to convert, minimum rate you convert referrals and recommendations at from existing clients and professional connections to be 4%, 40%, sorry, 4, 40%. So four out of 10. Um, and I've seen a lot of firms do higher than that. Um, the rate of which you convert those is based on, in large part, clients recommending you to, and post professional connections recommending you to, uh, the right type of people. And then all other lead sources tends to be about 20%, maybe a bit, a bit lower. Um, and depending on the mix that you get, the proportion of your leads that come from referrals, the proportion that come from other sources, would dictate the blend, but again, I'd say the blend is about 25%. I'd be looking for marketing to be generating uh, prospects, right fit prospects at a rate of about 75%. Um, and you do need to record everything, as I say, but I would be looking for marketing to be generating prospects at a rate of about, right fit rate of about uh, 75%. And then, Finally, in terms of recommendation rate, minimum of 25%. Now, crudely, that means that one in four of your clients are recommending you on to other people who actually then get in touch. And the rate of a say about one in four a year. I have seen that quite significantly higher, north of 50%. Uh, and again, those firms who have a higher recommendation rate will have a higher conversion rate, will spend less money on marketing, will be operationally more efficient, et cetera. So those are my gut feel, entirely subjective, but based on quite a bit of data that I've seen, minimum benchmarks that I believe advice firms should be aiming at. So if anybody's got any comments on those, please put them in the chat. And Dan, did I see anything else come in the chat a minute ago? Um, no. No worries, but at least I got a cup of tea. Um, so those are so benchmarks I think you should be aiming at. So let's have a think about why prospects might not be converting. And I think there's broadly five reasons. People on the call might have other ideas, but I think there's broadly five reasons. First, inquiries aren't from right fit prospects. If people are coming to you for a service that you don't offer, or they're coming to you and the fit isn't right because you don't work with that type of person, you can't add value to somebody because of the asset levels, et cetera, then there's a problem with, with the market. So those are, that's a key reason why conversion rates might be relatively low if inquiries aren't from right fit prospects. There could be a problem with pricing or proposition. It is becoming easier for consumers to compare financial advisor A with financial advisor B. Um, look at some of the tools on vouched for, for example. Um, as more firms decide to disclose their fees, there's been some 
robust debate on LinkedIn over the past couple of weeks about uh, fee disclosure online, uh, but more firms are doing it. Um, we've done some research over the last three years, the number of firms disclosing fees online have broadly doubled and it becomes easier to compare. And that means there might be a, an issue with pricing or proposition that means clients or prospects don't convert. We also have the advisor planners ability to sell a busy there are again, terms like hunter gatherer farmer that sort of stuff we've all got different skill sets and i know some advisors some planners have struggled in the past to convert inquiries i also know that some planners as they move towards a fixed fee proposition rather than charges based on percentages have struggled as well uh, it's common knowledge that people understand pound, shillings and pence better than they understand percentages. And I speak to a lot of advisors who are transitioning their business from percentage based charging to fixed fees. And it is harder. Yeah? It, it is harder for them to communicate value. So that might be an issue as well. The onboarding process might be ineffective. Um, so if you are not communicating with clients during the onboarding process, um, updating them with what is happening, they will potentially fall off and ultimately decide not to proceed or to go somewhere, go somewhere else. Um, there's some really good stuff in that, in uh, Stephen Bartlett's 33 Rules Diary of a CEO book that was out a few months ago. Um, and he talks about um, how Uber help for, uh, help customers know where their cab is, where their taxi is. Um, Domino's Pizza. Uh, if you order a pizza from Domino's, you get that little wheel telling you where your pizza is. All those sorts of things can help improve the onboarding process and help clients understand or prospects understand where they are in that. So if your onboarding is ineffective or not as effective as it could be, that might uh, hit your conversion rate. And then operational issues. Are you getting back to the prospect quickly enough? Ideally the same day, if not the next day. Um, and I gave that example earlier, where large proportion of inquiry, inquiries were right fit, but the firm weren't getting back and that impacted their conversion rates. So there are five reasons why prospects are not converting. Really important that we record the lost reason for prospects as well, because that's going to help us understand why prospects aren't converting. And I've even seen some firms do surveys of prospects every year, every two years, to try and understand why they might not have become a client. If their conversion rate is really low, and so we've seen some firms do really short surveys, two or three questions, to prospects who didn't convert, to ask them why, what did we do wrong? What could we have done better? And that's really useful information as well. Dan, before I go and talk about ways to improve conversion rates, um, questions? Yeah, so um, we've got a great question in from Andrew who asks, would you bother recording a phone call via a Google search? If somebody Googled Advice Centre Sheffield, for example, but you're in Blackpool, and let's say in this instance, you never get their name and the call is under one minute. Up 100% record it, yeah. I mean, you might have a record as John Doe or something like that, or Jane Doe or something like that. But 100%, because that's really useful information. Because if you were to get a series of those calls in a really short space or over a period of time, that's an indication that your marketing isn't working. It's an indication that your marketing is creating leads in Blackpool when you're in Sheffield. And if you don't record that information, and I know it might feel pain in the neck to record it but if you don't record that information you don't know when you come to sit down and analyze your data that actually there is a problem with your marketing so a little bit like if you were getting inquiries for um define benefit transfers okay? and it's not something you do but you kept getting those inquiries it's a signal that there is something out there that is pushing people to you so you need to try and find it so long-winded answer to a short question, the short answer, Andrew, is yes. Thanks. Uh, 
second question we'll go for is a question from Daniel, which I, I promise isn't me asking a question in third person. This is um, another Daniel on the call. Um, Daniel asks, how do you factor in inquiries where the firm is one of three perhaps being considered? Um, so, first thing is, back to what I said before, it absolutely gets recorded. Yeah, absolutely gets recorded. And in the same way of every other lead, back to the Blackpool, Sheffield thing in a sec. 100% recorded. Second thing I would do there is... I'd probably get a bit more intentional about if I didn't, finding out why I lost it, if the client didn't convert, um, I would maybe ask the prospect, assume you won it, that's brilliant. And if you won it, then I talk to the client about right, what was it about us that made you choose us rather than the other firms? Don't break any confidences but really interested to know, because this is going to help me make, build a better business. What was it about us and our proposition that meant you felt more comfortable coming to us than somebody else? So I'd ask the client that. If the prospect doesn't convert and go somewhere else, I would still say to them, look, do you mind if we have 10 minutes on the phone? Really want to understand. Passionate about building a great business. Really want to understand what it was about our proposition that wasn't right for you, or what it was about the person that you uh, went to that was you felt was a better fit. So I would be having conversations either way, whether you win it or whether you lose it, about why they chose you or why they didn't. A bit of a debrief. Hopefully that answers the question, Danny. Um, right, let's go for a question from Andrew next, who asks... How soon do you recommend responding to an inquiry, such as vouched for, or contact via the website? Does too fast, say, within an hour, look like we're not busy? Oh, man. Um, so the short answer is I'm not sure. Yeah, um, it is so subjective. I, um, when I was uh, at a firm previous life, we can uh, we create lots of annuity inquiries, and you have to respond to those really quickly because someone put an inquiry into uh, the search in, into our website, and you knew they were putting that inquiry into other websites as well. So if the advisor waited twenty minutes to ring, they generally got the engaged tone because somebody else had got in there first. Um, so for me, I uh, you can overthink this, but I would be responding reasonably quickly. Try and do it. Try and do it in that same half day. So if it comes in the morning, try and do it in the morning. If it comes in the afternoon, try and do it in the afternoon. Um, if for some reason, Andrew, you're out of the office um, and can't, then maybe get somebody else to put in a holding call. So get somebody to pick up the phone for the prospect. Andrew isn't here. He's out with clients, um, but he'll be in touch tomorrow. Or do, a, do an email, a holding email. I think that really helps to show people that you care. Um, so I would probably do it the same morning or the same afternoon if you can't get somebody to put that holding call or holding email in and let you follow up. But I think it is subjective. Right. Um, so on that, I mean, we've got a good comment in from um, Jean Paolo who says, about the speed of a reply to an initial email, um, I always respond within an hour saying, got your email, thanks for engaging, really busy at the moment but would like to schedule a Zoom for next Wednesday, for example. Um, so give themselves a little bit of space between now and then, and at least it's an instant response. Um, we will have one more question before we move on. Um, this one is from Quinn. Great question. Quinn asks, if you've had an inquiry, but were unable to reach them, how many times should you attempt to contact them and over what period of time? Good question. Um, so again, I don't know if there is a... Uh, a finite number. Um, I would try different ways. So try phone call, try email, try WhatsApp, um, try something we're going to talk about on the on the next slide. Um, again, I don't think there's a finite number. Uh, I've, um, I do think there's a finite end to it though, which we'll come on to in the next slide. 
Right. Well, let's crack on to that next slide then. Let's do that, shall we? Okay. Mm. So six things. Uh, this isn't a definitive list, uh, but six things that will improve your conversion rate. So the first is to make sure that your marketing is as good as it possibly can be at creating right fit inquiries. Measure the proportion that are right fit. Measure the proportion, therefore, that aren't right fit. Find out the reasons they're not right fit and then work back through your marketing to fix it. And a lot of that, especially when it comes to referrals and recommendations from existing clients and uh, professional connections, is training them, educating them on who is the right person to recommend you to. It's really important that your clients and your professional connections know who you work with and know who you don't work with. I've even seen some websites, minority, but I've seen them, where you might get a list on the website. These are the people we work with. These are the people we're not right for. And maybe even some signposting out. The first thing to do is understand what proportion are right fit, what proportion aren't right fit. Work back and tweak your marketing based on that data. Second thing, walk in your prospect shoes. Review, refine and improve every stage of your onboarding process. Little things like I've just said to Andrew, put in that holding call. Someone will be back in touch tomorrow. Andrew's in a, in a meeting. Uh, but walk in your prospect shoes and understand the onboarding process. And then where possible, refine it and improve it. Because the onboarding process, that sales funnel, same thing, is so important. It's absolutely crucial you get it right. Monthly newsletters. Now, this is a hill I will die on, and I probably will end up dying on. But newsletters should be sent at least monthly to prospects. So your newsletter should be sent to clients, prospects, and professional connections. From a prospect perspective, they underpin, and this goes back to somebody's question earlier, they underpin effective nurturing because it means if you get your newsletter right, you are adding value, you are touching that prospect with your brand every month, you're demonstrating your knowledge, and those three things combine position you as the go back to person. So when they're ready to engage, it's you that they come back to because you've been in touch with them every month, you've added value, you've demonstrated knowledge, rather than them looking elsewhere. There's a bunch of other reasons to do monthly newsletters, but in terms of nurturing prospects, that's massively important. Engage with them on social media as well. So go and find your clients on social media. Look them up, for example, on LinkedIn. Connect with them. That means if they go onto LinkedIn and spend time there, they'll see your posts. But go and engage with their posts as well, whether it's LinkedIn, Facebook, X, Instagram, TikTok, who, who knows. But go and engage with them. It's a really low, soft way of reminding them you are there and reminding them that you are ready, willing, and able. Facebook pixel advertising works nicely for that as well. Uh, we've got Abby on today, head of social media. And Facebook pixel advertising works really well. So someone visits your website, um, they then see adverts, reminders of your brand on Facebook, reminds them that they visited and redirects them back to your website. Find other ways to add value as well. Scorecard marketing, really popular this year. Webinars, we're doing more webinars and helping more advisors, planners run webinars than ever before. Really valuable way of adding value to prospects. Really low cost, really efficient way of speaking to a relatively large group of people at the same time. You can use Existing content, existing blogs, guys, that you've got to write the webinar. So you're repurposing existing content. That makes it efficient. Um, and then when you run your webinar, 
chop it down, use it on social media, put it on your website as a library, put a transcript on that to help your SEO, all sorts of ways of repurposing that content. So find other ways to add value. And then lastly, and this goes back to what somebody else said earlier about how many times you should be um, trying to engage. Um, I don't know what the exact answer is. I don't think there is an exact answer for how many times. I do think there's an endpoint. And that endpoint is to use Chris Voss's magic email on page 92 of Never Split the Difference. And I'm sure a bunch of you on here have read the book. A bunch of you will know what I mean by the magic email. Um, and the magic email is very straightforward. It's your last interaction. It's the last attempt that you have to engage them. Will be they'll end up on your newsletter list, but it's the last attempt you have to engage them. And it's very simple. Dear Dan, have you given up on seeking financial advice? Regards, Phil. No fluff. No, hi, how's the dog? Hope you're okay. None of that. Hope this finds you well. I'm really guilty of that. It's simply, dear Dan, have you given up on seeking financial advice? Regards, Phil. And it's a no-orientated question. People find no-orientated questions really safe to answer. And that gets a response about 80% of the time. And that response is almost always, no, not given up on it. Really sorry, I've just been busy. Let's re-engage. It is short. It is direct and to the point but it works and it never ever gets any negativity. If you're in doubt, there's a LinkedIn thread. I put a picture of this up yesterday on LinkedIn and there's a few people there saying they've used it and used it well. So go and have a look at that thread. But the Chris Foss magic email is a fantastic way of waking up prospects. I know one financial planner really well who uh, over Christmas last year, um, they were just doing some admin. They found they'd got three prospects who hadn't been back in touch. They sent the Chris Voss magic email to all three prospects and all those three prospects became clients in January. Now, I'm not saying you're going to have a 100% hit rate like that, but it is tremendously beneficial. And if anybody's used the, VOD, the Voss magic email, put something in the chat. So in terms of conversion rates, we have spoken about today the importance of them the data points you need to monitor, where you record that data, the five conversion rates you should be monitoring, some of the reasons why people don't convert and some ways to improve them. So I really hope you have some practical stuff you can take away. Before we finish, we have a favor to ask. Abby, Dan and myself have a favor to ask. This is our 10th webinar this year, not doing one in December, we'll be back in January. But we have created a very short webinar quest, uh, survey. It's four questions, take you two minutes to complete it. It's your way of saying thank you to us and helping these webinars get better next year. So if you could, Dan's gonna put the link in the chat. If before you go and make a cup of tea, before you check your emails, before you do anything else, you could just click that link and go and answer the four questions. I would really appreciate it. And it will be, mean that we can tailor the content for these webinars to what you want to hear about from us next year. If anybody doesn't know how to contact us, there are our contact details, the website address, LinkedIn, Twitter, I should change that to Twitter X now or X or whatever it's called now, email address. And Bell's saying it's 11 o'clock, really happy to stick around and answer questions. Um, but before everyone goes, just want to say thank you for your uh, great questions, interactions today and on all the other webinars we've done this year. Um, I really enjoy delivering them. I hope you enjoy them and you get value from them as well. So, Dan, what questions have we got? Right. So um, we've talked about good ways to nurture clients in general, but Charlie asks, what are good ways to nurture professional connections? Wow. Um, there is just a huge amount that you could do there. Um, and to be fair, Charlie, we've had some demand to do webinars about that next year. Um, and I think there's some um, 
really good quality guests we could get on there. So I think I'll probably defer that to next year and we're running some webinars. But right now, I think a couple of things I to say to take away. I would think about whether you want to think about who you want to be working with to start with. What's the ideal type of client you want to be working with? That leads to a simple question. Can professional connections help and introduce me to that type of client? Yes or no. If the answer is yes, what type of professional connection can introduce me to that client? So is it an accountant? And if so, what type of accountant? Is it a solicitor? If so, what type of solicitor? Litigation, commercial, um, family, divorce, et cetera. So I'd work back like that and start thinking about who you want to be working with to start with. Brilliant. So um, as, as an aside, Charlie, um, click the Survey Monkey link and make your vote count, because as Phil says, we may very well cover that topic next year. Um, a question in from Gavin, um, who I can only admire the determination of this question. Um, Gavin asks, if you use the Chris Boss email and get a yes, would you then remove them from the mailing list? When you say mailing list, do you mean the newsletter mailing list? Because uh, the short answer is no. Um, all clients, prospects and uh, personal connections should be on your newsletter mailing list until they unsubscribe. Yeah. Um, so if I've understood the question correctly, the answer would be no. Assuming um, that Gavin meant the, the follow-up um, pr process, then yes, <laughs> except a no in that, in that instance. Um, let's see. Um, so Stephen, absolutely yes, this will be um, available for replay. Um, so you'll get a follow-up email with a link to this recording. So don't worry that you arrived later. You'll be able to see the whole thing um, in full HD later on. And... I believe that's the end of our questions. So any more for any more, but this is very much um, me ringing the bell for the year. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Dan. Thank you for having for your support this year. It's really appreciated. See everybody in 2024. How did that happen? See you soon. Bye-bye. Take care, guys. Bye.